what we're going to talk about today is uh, what's going on both nationally and in the biggest state in the union, California. California has one eighth of all the births in the United States, 550,000 a year. Uh, what's going on in terms of maternal mortality and maternal morbidity, both in, in the increase and as you will see, we've actually made a dent in it. Uh, we're going to go through very quickly some of the definitions of maternal mortality and severe morbidity, the top five causes, and what we can do as professionals and as a team uh, to help reduce uh, maternal mortality. I have no disclosures. Uh, we are supported in, in this effort in maternal mortality reviews by the state of California. And I must say, we've had a, in our maternal mortality review committee, which I also chair, uh, we've had a, a great uh, effort uh, from a number of the leading anesthesiologists in the room, including Sheila Cohen, your past president, uh, Ed Riley, who's director of anesthesia at Stanford, uh, Patsy Daly, who's a wonderful uh, community anesthesiologist. So we've had great support. Uh, my slides are a little different than what's in your handout because there's a, a number of articles that got published just in the last even weeks. Uh, in December, uh, in the Green Journal, uh, the CDC published national data. Uh, we got release of some of the California data a few weeks ago. And in April, which came out a few days ago, April Green Journal, we published our California analysis of the leading causes of pregnancy-related mortality. And then a national bundle for hemorrhage has also uh, <clears throat> been released and will be published in, and I'm very pleased to say, in the, simultaneously in the Green Journal and in Anesthesia and Algesia and in the uh, Nursing Journal Joggin, uh, probably in June. And we're going to discuss that uh, in the second session. So <clears throat> overall, <coughs> The reduction in maternal mortality has been the, a spectacular public health success in the United States. If you, if you look back at the turn of the last century, uh, 1900, 1920, it was 800 per 100,000. And then it fell very dramatically through the 40s and 50s uh, to a very low level in the 1990s. Declared a success and we broke camp, so to speak, stopped our maternal mortality review committees, uh, and, de and declared uh, a success. What happened, though, is while the rest of the industrialized world uh, continued to improve, as you see here, Germany, France, Italy had sequential uh, decreases from 1980, 1990, 2000, 2008, the United States was the only one that plateaued and then went up. Uh, this is uh, in more detail in, in uh, green is the U.S. maternal mortality rate from the CDC, showing this increase in the 2000s. California, as I said, is the biggest state by far, one-eighth of the birth week. We were basically right there in line with the U.S. each and every year, plus or minus just a little bit. Uh, and we're going to show you what happened later uh, with that. Uh, the CDC data, this came out showing here, and you can see there's been a general decline uh, as they follow this with death certificates. And let me just caution you, death certificates that give maternal mortality rates, whereas a careful case review gives you a pregnancy-related mortality rate. They're somewhat similar, but they're, you have to take a death certificate uh, determination of cause of death with a a little bit of skepticism, but nonetheless, you can see the leading causes of death are hemorrhage, hypertensive disorders, infection in this setting, pulmonary emboli, and a little lesser amniotic fluid emboli. Fortunately, as you see in the middle, very low rates nowadays for anesthesia-related maternal mortalities. What has increased on the right-hand side are what was formerly called indirect causes. Uh, which are underlying medical conditions, some related, some not to the pregnancy, such as cardiomyopathy. The largest cause of maternal death in the United States is cardiovascular disease, uh, which is going to be very important for this audience, both pregnancy, i.e. Uh, cardiomyopathy. We actually have another article in press 
uh, examining the different types of cardiomyopathy. Not all are pregnancy related. There's hypertensive cardiomyopathy, which is a significant portion here, and other causes. Uh, one of the greatest concerns, and actually the greatest disparities of all public health measures, is maternal mortality in African Americans, with a three plus X disparity. Three times more African American women die than any other race, or all races combined. So this is the article that's published uh, three days ago, early release, about what we found in comparing and contrasting maternal mortality uh, uh, causes. Uh, and what you're going to see is that you should not consider maternal mortality as a single clinical entity, but really be able to look at the five causes and, and, and they have different, uh, different pathways toward improvement. So we saw in California, similar to the nation, that the leading cause was cardio, cardiovascular disease, followed by preeclampsia and OB obstetric hemorrhage, venous thromboembolism, and AFE. Infection wasn't in our top five. Uh, and indeed, uh, anesthesia deaths were almost negligible in California. When you turn this then to a rate as opposed to a percent, uh, this is a percent of all the deaths, but more importantly, you should need to look at the rate because then you can follow the rate over time or the rate compared to other countries of specific causes. So now we're going to look at African-American deaths in California. This is 4X. Uh, the, uh, all other races are pretty much identical. Uh, even uh, Latinas are about 50% of the births in California almost the same uh, maternal mortality rate as whites or Asians, 9.7, but African Americans are 39. Uh, when you look at cardiovascular deaths, this is one of the reasons that's considerably higher for African American women. So they have 7x the cardiovascular death rate. So the take home message, one of the take home messages here is that if you have an African American woman who is obese and hypertensive, you have to be very cautious about her cardiovascular status. Those things go together fairly commonly, and that's an extraordinarily high risk setting. So BMI, uh, Dr. Scavone is going to be speaking about obesity in the next lecture. Uh, we were quite interested in the relationship between obesity and maternal mortality because that has been increasing over that last decade. When you think about what's increased in the Last decade that had the rise in maternal mortality, yes, there was an increase in maternal age, a big increase in maternal weight, or BMI, uh, as well as underlying medical conditions. Now, so this is BMI. The column on the far right is our control population, all births in California. See about 16% obesity rate in this time period. This is pre-pregnancy BMIs. So uh, overweight is the red, and normal weight is the blue. Uh, so when you go through the five causes here, you can see only two are significantly, have significantly higher rates of obesity. Cardiovascular disease, 42% obese, and venous thromboembolism, 58% obese. Uh, preeclampsia, deaths from preeclampsia, deaths from hemorrhage, and deaths from amniotic fluid did not have significantly higher rates of obesity. So the effects of obesity are really concentrated on cardiovascular disease, on a venous thromboembolism, which should not be a surprise. You know obese, uh, obese patients and other medical specialties have higher rates of venous thromboembolism. It should be noted <clears throat> that none of our deaths in, from, from venous thromboembolism in this time period had any chemoprophylaxis, even though they were obese or morbidly obese. 26% were morbidly obese. Uh, so I think there are some clear opportunities there. So these are the only two causes that had high rates of obesity higher than the general population. So the timing of death is actually also quite different and in interesting patterns between the five leading causes, AFEs, venous thromboembolism, OB hemorrhage, and preeclampsia. Uh, you could see that, uh, not surprisingly, venous thromboembolism happens significantly later than AFE or hemorrhage, which are generally labor and delivery 
immediate events. Cardiovascular disease is the one that has the long tail. This is a box and whiskers plot. Uh, and what you see on the inset is how to interpret that. The uh, middle line is the mean, and the big box is the 25 to 75th uh, percentiles. And you can see there's a skewed di di distribution with a very long tail. Now, chance to alter outcome. This is our way of determining preventability. Preventability in a maternal mortality review is inherently subjective. You're looking at cases retrospectively. You're trying to make a judgment. You weren't there. Uh, what we teased out, and it's very hard to be dichotomous, yes, no. Uh, what we had our committee do was to make judgments as what was the chance to have altered the outcome? Uh, you know, were there specific and feasible actions that could have been implemented that would have changed the trajectory of the women's disease, is how we define that. And there were some significant differences here. Uh, Preeclampsia, hemorrhage, and VTE had 50% or 70, to 70% chance of good or strong chance to have altered the outcome, uh, whereas AFE was a harder one, a uh, much harder one. Uh, with 83% had some, uh, and so there was some hope there, but this is, again, a different time period. Now, we spent a lot of time looking at contributing factors. I'm going to blow this slide up in a moment, so don't, don't worry. Uh, the, we looked at contributing factors among phys uh, providers, facilities, and patients to see what, uh, what were the drivers for the maternal death. And the size of the bars gives you a sense from zero to 100 the percent of cases. And you can see that the top category, which was provider factors, had far and away the strongest ones. Uh, so we're going to dive down into these uh, as we go along. So this had more contributing factors, uh, in particular among obstetric hemorrhage and preeclampsia. Uh, the preventability side has been shown by other studies as well. Uh, North Carolina, uh, with the CDC, did about a six-year review of preventability, showing hemorrhage and preeclampsia were far and away the most preventable. UK defined it differently in their confidential inquiries and maternal deaths, uh, looking at substandard care that had a major contribution to the case. And they also, the UK had been working on hemorrhage for about a decade, and so they had a little less preventability among the remaining hemorrhage deaths. So what makes it preventable? Uh, this is a blow up of the provider factors. And what we saw was a, a recurring theme of delayed response to clinical warning signs. Uh, Dr. Meyer is going to be speaking to you later this morning about uh, MUSE or, or paying attention to clinical warnings. And that's a really important direction that I think we're all going to go in as we work as a team. So delayed response to either vital signs uh, or clinical uh, signs, uh, clinical symptoms or laboratory values was a driver in a very large number of both of these cases, both of these causes. And then ineffective care. Uh, this time period, there was very little use of balloons. There was very little poor use of uterotonic medications or of antihypertensive medications. And our twin demons that you see in the lower right here that we see again and again in these cases was denial and delay. And I think those are things that we've all seen on our labor and delivery units. Uh, so it's evolved that the two most, uh, the hemorrhage and preeclampsia are the most common preventable causes. And as you see, they are the most common causes of severe maternal morbidity. And they have high rates of, of provider, shall we say, quality improvement opportunities. So we say severe morbidity, what are we referring to? Uh, there are a couple of approaches to that. One is uh, developed by Stacy Geller and Sarah Kilpatrick in the University of Illinois, uh, Chicago, that, was, that ended up looking at uh, defining severe morbidity in near miss by the, uh, a definition of four units of blood transfusion or ICU admission. Uh, that's very effective, and that's, as we'll talk about, uh, it's been picked up by the Joint Commission, but that's not a measure, that's an indicator. And you can't measure those items outside the hospital. So what the CDC did in a series of articles was to identify how to measure severe maternal morbidity, 
using ICD-9 codes for diagnoses that are typically those seen in an ICU. Pulmonary edema, being on a ventilator, ARDS, renal failure, those sorts of things. Uh, and blood transfusion. Uh, as we'll see, that's a significant driver. Uh, so this is the CDC's measure uh, applied over time over that last decade. Uh, they chose a scale of, of 10,000, so the, one point, the 129 in the far upper right is actually 1.29% of births. You can see in the same time period, maternal mortality rose by 50 to 100%. Maternal morbidity also rose that 50 to 75%. But note the green and the orange. The green is all maternal morbidity, severe maternal morbidities. And the yellow or orange here is after you subtract transfusions. So what changed in this time period was really the rate of hemorrhage and the rate of uh, blood transfusions. So when you combine different ways of looking at morbidity and mortality, you see in this slide, mortality is 1 to 2 per 10,000. And you have a distribution. This is roughed up a uh, collection of a whole series of articles in the U.S. About even numbers of, of emboli, infection, hemorrhage, and preeclampsia of 10 to 15 percent in most studies, with cardiac disease being the most common. If you were to define severe maternal morbidity as ICU admissions, you get a change in distribution, uh, and that's one to two per thousand. However, if you go on and use the CDC definition, which is one to two per hundred, or one to two percent. Hemorrhage and preeclampsia dramatically dominate. We just finished a severe morbidity study in California, uh, and those two account for 80% of the severe morbidities, is hemorrhage and preeclampsia. Uh, therefore, uh, they were the directions that we first went to uh, in California for a series of toolkits and then quality collaboratives for hemorrhage and for preeclampsia. This has been taken up at the national level uh, by the National Maternal Health Initiative, uh, which is uh, major, major organizations uh, trying to address maternal mortality. Uh, we put together an ACOG CDC work group that was multidisciplinary uh, with core safety bundles in hemorrhage, severe hypertension, and v VTE prevention, and then supplemental safety bundles on Eternal early warning sign, family, facility review, and family and staff support. Uh, we published now a series of articles uh, in the green and soon to be other journals. And then this has been picked up uh, by the Council on Patient Safety uh, with the following not insignificant challenge that what every birthing facility in the United States should have our safety bundles for hemorrhage, hypertension, and venous thromboembolism. Uh, the Council on Patient Safety and Women's Health Care is vice president or president level representatives from every maternal health organization, including yours, from SOAP, ASA, ACOG, A1. Uh, I've been in Washington enough now, I know all the acronyms, but it, there's a lot of organizations engaged in this process. And the first bundle uh, is on obstetric hemorrhage. And we're going to talk about that in a more detail in the uh, next session after 10 o'clock. Uh, but this a bundle uh, is not a defined protocol, but it's saying that you should have a protocol that is goes with a checklist. We give you your examples. You can tweak it in, to fit your local hospital's resources and needs, but you should have a team plan. And you should have a, a hemorrhage card. And there are a number of things, resources, that we feel that you should have. Importantly, also, uh, with a consensus statement from uh, leaders from the CDC as well as ACOG and SMM, we developed some facility identifiers for severe maternal morbidity, which included uh, the four units of blood transfusion and the ICU admission as the highlights. This has now been picked up by the Joint Commission. It's one thing for ACOG or ASA or SOAP to make a, a recommendation, but what people really listen to is the Joint Commission. For better or worse, uh, when the Joint Commission speaks, all the hospital administrators do listen. And they revise their sentinel event. 
definition in January. Uh, you know, they've been listening to this process and coming to the National Council meetings all along, and they said, what can we do? And they, this is what they came up with. So a Sentinel event is now defined to include severe temporary harm. This is a revision of the overall Sentinel event process, not just OB. Uh, severe temporary harm, not permanent harm necessarily. And for OB, that was four units of blood uh, or admission to an ICU with a couple of important caveats here. The buts include, they exclude cases that are a result of the natural course of the underlying condition. So if you have an accreta or a previa and you get four units, that's not a sentinel event. Uh, what they really, really were stressing though is all these cases should go to a multidisciplinary systems level review, not a peer review, but a systems level review. What can we do to improve the system of care at our hospital? That's really what they're striving for. And they've changed what you do for a sentinel event to be broader than just an RCA. So what they're looking for is a multidisciplinary review that is thorough, credible, and has an action plan, that you find some things that you can change. Uh, the, the next publication out was Jo Meyer. You're going to hear from her in a few moments. Uh, but this is going to be an important direction, as I said, for us to go to. So what we've done then in California is a whole series of steps. Uh, we started off with the Hemorrhage Task Force uh, with, uh, that was multidisciplinary. It included Mark Rollins, uh, who I uh, think spoke yesterday, uh, leaders in OB, in, in anesthesiology, and nursing, and midwifery from around the state, uh, and our blood bank uh, uh, association. Did a toolkit that was published and at the same time started running collaboratives in 2000, started first in actually in late 2009 to test the tool and implementation. So we've run four 30 hospital collaboratives, uh, including ones in LA County, ones in Kaiser, as well as uh, general collaboratives around the state. We have 250 maternity hospitals in California. And now we're in the midst of statewide implementation with some uh, support from the Merck uh, Merck for Mothers Foundation. We have the same pattern for preeclampsia. First, to develop a consensus within our state, mobilizing a number of leaders from universities, from uh, clinical practice, uh, and then do the toolkit, uh, and then multi-hospital collaborative, and we're working on uh, statewide implementation uh, this year as well. And we are just finishing a cardiovascular toolkit uh, to help people recognize. This is going to be a bit different because cardiovascular disease is a lot more outpatient than labor and delivery focused. Uh, and so this is going to be uh, a, a different set of challenges. Uh, but nonetheless, this is where we were. I showed this at the beginning. Uh, and then when we started working, we started seeing a significant decline. And this is continuing. So we're now down to six. So it is doable. Uh, this is the biggest state in the Union by far, so it has the biggest challenges, if you were. Maybe New York might argue with this. New York City is actually in the 25 range. Uh, but it's, you know, by working together and bringing all our specialties together, uh, nursing included, we've been able to get a lot more teamwork on labor and delivery and a lot more effort uh, being focused on, you know, our first steps were hemorrhage and preeclampsia. But those are prototypic causes. You know, what I like about working on hemorrhage first is that hemorrhage, response to hemorrhage is really a true team response. Now, a lot of this has done team steps, which is OK in the abstract, but you really want to have uh, experience with real cases. And hemorrhage is a really good example of what, of what a team response can do. So, I think it's served to improve the safety of, for all conditions, not just for hemorrhage. Uh, now, maternal mortality, oh, this is California data again, uh, has gone down in all races. Uh, it's gone down significantly in African Americans, but you still see this big racial uh, disparity in the rates. You know, whereas others are six to nine, this is 29. 
so we still have significant work to do. California has not the highest rate of African Americans in the country. It's only about 7% of births. Uh, but they are concentrated and they do pose a significant uh, quality improvement opportunity, shall you say. This is maternal mortality by maternal age. Uh, the outlier orange is moms 40 to 54. There aren't too many of those except here in San Francisco, where I work. Uh, the, average, the average age, I, have, I was chair for 15 years at a very large hospital here in San Francisco, 5,000 to 6,000 births. The average age of our mothers was 35. So half the mothers were over 35. My wife is a prenatal diagnosis geneticist, so she had lots of business, so to say. But uh, what is important here is uh, the, the ability to bring down the maternal mortality in the 40 to 54, but also in the 30, uh, 35 to 39, that blue line. That's a lot larger group of patients, is women in their 30s, of course. Uh, and you, know, you see the lowest rate of all is in the 20 to 24 year olds who in my hospital seem almost too young to have kids, but that's probably the optimal age when you get right down to it. Now, one of our challenges that we're facing in California is how to roll this out to hospitals of all sizes. Most of us work in bigger hospitals. This is the size distribution of, by delivery rate of all the hospitals in the United States. So you can see in the red circle here on the lower right uh, that uh, there, for hospitals over 3,000 births or over 4,000 births, there aren't that many. But that's where most of maternal fetal medicine and, and many of the OB anesthesiologists are working. Uh, the challenge is half the hospitals are under 1,000 births a year. Under 1,000 births. That's a whole different ballgame in terms of what you do for, what you have for resources, what you have for skill sets, what you have in your blood bank. Uh, all those issues are very different in smaller hospitals. And that's a focus area that we're working on right now because everybody knows California has big cities, San, the Bay Area, Los Angeles, San Diego, but we also have a lot of mountain and rural uh, uh, agricultural communities that have very small hospitals. And I think before we're done, we have to have good plans uh, to roll out these bundles uh, in a way that's going to support care at those, including, though, uh, in the levels of care document just came out from ACOG and Society of Maternal Fetal Medicine, a better focus on regionalization of highest risk mothers away from low level, low resource facilities. Certainly, a creatus should not deliver any, anywhere that does not have a lot of experience and a very large blood bank. So this is a continuing challenge. What do we do for small hospitals? Uh, and this is a, a now has a national focus as well. So thank you very much. And we're going to have questions, I believe, after the uh, full set of presentations.